95% of all UFO sightings can be immediately identified. It's the 5% that give you the release. Oh! Pilots chase them sometimes, but can't catch them. There are near misses between these things and commercial aircraft. And he saw the disc uh, of it. These are very hard to dismiss, the, the handful of sightings. A UFO in broad daylight near Paris. We suddenly observed a very bright red-orange object. It was oval. UFOs have interfered with missiles. I saw something that defied logic. Object of luminous. Reported a strange craft, triangular in shape. On the triangular shape craft. Mystery craft being seen. Dark metallic in appearance. Flying craft. There's an orange orb. Glowing orb. The glowing orb. A giant ball of light. Glowing object. Could be alien. Some form of alien spacecraft. Let's continue to take a look at UFOs, the great last day's deception. The third reason why the Bible says UFOs are clearly demonic in origin is because they travel like demons. Kind of like this sign behind us, the extraterrestrial gives us the impression. I don't think this is actually their highway, but let's take a look at the facts. Let's see how demons travel according to the Bible. And you tell me if they don't coincide with the same thing that these UFO occupants are able to do. But the Bible says this in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 through 18, When the servants of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. And the enemy came down toward him. Uh, Elijah prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, and as Elijah had asked. So here we see the classic passage in the Bible, where we see the prophet of God, Elijah, was being hunted down. And when his servant got up and saw an army coming against him, he freaked out. And so he ran to Elijah, and so Elijah, knowing better, asked God to open his servant's spiritual eyes so he could see that there was really no reason to be afraid. God's angels far outnumbered the army that was opposing them. And so here's the point in sharing that passage. This is just one of many passages in the Bible that tells us how angels uh, and how they travel, and demons, of course, are in that category, only they're the fallen angels. And, and what we see is, according to this text, they have the ability to appear and disappear, uh, to materialize and to dematerialize, and to frankly travel very rapidly in that fashion. And wonder of wonders, that's precisely what these UFOs and their supposed occupants also do. Let's take a look at how they travel. The first travel indicator, number one is this, UFO experts are saying that these beings are not so much physical in nature as they are spiritual. And that's because they clock them at speeds up to 15,000 miles per hour, making right turns, which would instantly destroy anything physical like this video shows. Let's take a look. The significant wave of sightings over uh, Belgium in particular in 1989 and 1990 of a triangular aircraft have yet to be identified to this day. On that first night, the police are swamped with telephone calls from 150 witnesses. Soon, sightings of the Yupin Triangle, as it comes to be called, are reported throughout the country. The UFO phenomena there results in an unprecedented level of cooperation between various government agencies and private UFO investigators. UFO incidents. The Belgium Air Force quickly takes the lead in setting up a procedure for tracking this unidentified flying object. Colonel Wilfred de Browner, the Air Force's chief of operations, coordinates a special task force to work with local and national police agencies as well as civilian UFO investigators. 
On the night of March 30th, 1990, the triangle is sighted again. Two Belgian F-16 fighters are scrambled from Beauvachain Air Base. Despite flying for over an hour, the pilots are unable to make visual contact with the UFO, but do manage to record radar images of it. The encounter leads some to speculate that the Yupin Triangle is actually an American craft. If so, the most likely culprit would be the F-117A stealth fighter. This secret, triangular-shaped aircraft is designed to have a minimal radar signature. But sophisticated analysis conducted on both ground-based and onboard radar images of the Yupin Triangle calls this theory into doubt. According to the radar, the UFO could, within seconds, accelerate from 170 to 1,100 miles an hour and drop from 11,000 feet to near ground level. Maneuvers like those would generate an enormous G-force, far in excess of what military testing films show a human can endure, thereby dismissing the possibility of the UFO as man or American-made. And that's why researchers say they are massless by our physics, i.e. spiritual, in nature. Hmm. Demons are spiritual, aren't they? That's interesting. Travel indicator number two is this. UFOs are not only able to go faster than the speed of sound, but they make no sonic boom like a normal physical object does. Another clue that they're spiritual in nature. Travel indicator number three shows this. Radar has never recorded the actual entering of UFOs in our atmosphere. They just kind of appear. Travel indicator number four says that even with supposed millions of advanced civilizations in outer space, it would be almost impossible if just once a year for an extraterrestrial craft to find us out here on the limb of our galaxy. Yet, we are seeing literally tens of thousands of these so-called craft every single year. That's kind of strange and leads us to travel indicator number five. These so-called aliens seem to be able to live in our atmosphere without the help of respiratory devices. Find that kind of interesting. Uh, number six states this, that UFOs have been fired upon scores of times by American, Russian, and Canadian pilots, but these pilots have never been able to physically bring down a craft or to capture it. And number seven is this, UFO entities seem to have the ability to materialize and dematerialize at will as if coming from another doorway or portal, which just so happens also to be the ability that angels or angelic beings have, which of course the demons are only of the fallen category that rebelled against God with Satan. They too travel through dimensional doorways. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 12, verse 16 through 17, Quote, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haram. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Okay? And this is why many UFO experts are now saying that based on decades of research, that these beings, listen, aren't coming from outer space, but inner space. They're coming from another dimension. Okay? In fact, listen to some of these guys. Jacques Vallée, he said this, he says, They're more like windows into another dimension. Okay, And it's this uh, dimensional thinking that helps to explain some of the shape-shifting and morphing abilities these UFOs seem to have. For instance, it would be like a three-dimensional ball going through a two-dimensional piece of paper. From the paper's point of view, the ball would first appear as a small sphere as it entered and then gradually gets larger as it continued to enter until it reached the middle of the ball and then as it departed, it would get smaller and smaller until it totally disappeared. And that's precisely what some of these UFOs do as they enter and depart. Well, wait a second. As we saw, the Bible says demons come from another dimension called the spirit realm. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? And so again, these beings and their so-called craft don't appear to be so much physical in nature as they are spiritual 
in nature, another clue of their true identity. In fact, even Flying Saucer Review said this about UFOs. And first of all, let me explain. This periodical supports an assemblage of over 50 experts and specialists worldwide who conduct major UFO encounter investigations. And it's just one of the few journals that has objectively and thoroughly evaluated the phenomenon worldwide for almost 40 years now. An official statement by their one editor, Gordon Creighton, says, quote, There seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. Brad Steiger, he said, he thinks that the chances are very good that, quote, we are dealing with a multi-dimensional paraphysical phenomenon, which is largely indigenous to planet Earth. Arthur Clarke, he's the famous science fiction writer. He observes, quote, one theory that can no longer be taken very seriously is that UFOs are interstellar spaceships. And so, as you can see, based on these findings, many researchers believe that UFOs and their supposed occupants are clearly supernatural, spiritual in origin, and not something natural in origin, and certainly not something from outer space, okay? And, and, and once again, wonder of wonders, it just so happens to fit the profiles of demons. I don't think that's by chance. The fourth reason why the Bible says UFOs are clearly demonic in origin is they instill emotion like demons. As you can see here, a UFO come crashing through a wall, that kind of scare you a little bit. And that's precisely the point. When you take a look at UFOs and their occupants and what demons do when they appear on the scene, I think we got a direct correlation. Let's take a look at what the Bible says, uh, the emotions that uh, demons instill upon people once they appear on the scene. The Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through 27, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to the evil spirits and they obey him. And then Mark chapter 9 verse 19 through 27 says, A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If, if you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Okay, hey, that'll creep you out. And that's precisely the point. How many guys would say, according to the Bible, what we just read, that when a demon is on the scene, it instills some serious pain and torment and fear, okay? Just, just a little, as you can see, according to the text. And, and not just the person that's being uh, possessed by the demon and set free uh, by Jesus of the pain and torment, but imagine being one of those people who are witnessing there on the scene one of those direct encounters, okay? That obviously would instill some serious fear in them, right? Of course it would. Well, wonder of wonders, gee whiz, uh, one constant theme of the UFO entities is that they too just happened to instill massive fear and literally utter terror just like a demon when they too 
appear on the scene. But don't take my word for it, let's listen to those who've had actual encounters with UFOs and their occupants. Let's take a look at how they reacted to it. Whitley Stryber's encounter says this, uh, Whitley Strieber, by the way, is the author of the best-selling books Communion and Transformation about UFO encounters. Here's how he calls his own personal encounter. He says, quote, I became entirely given over to extreme dread. The fear was so powerful that it seemed to make my personality completely evaporate. Whitley ceased to exist. What was left was a body in a state of raw fear so great that it swept about me like a thick suffocating curtain, turning paralysis into a condition that seemed close to death. I died, and a wild animal appeared in my place. They had changed me, done something to me, he said. I wondered if there was any relationship between my experience and the mystic walk of the shaman, or the night ride of the witch. The visitors persisted in my mind like glowing coals. Whatever it was, it had been involved with me for years. I felt their presence. It was palatable. Most upsetting, I could smell them, he said. Increasingly, I felt as if they were entering a, I were entering a struggle that might uh, even be more than life or death. I might be in a struggle for my soul, my essence, or whatever part of me might have reference to the eternal. There are worse things than death, I suspect him. So far, the word demon had never been spoken among the scientists and doctors who were working with me. Alone at night, I worried about the legendary cunning of demons. At the very least, I was going stark raving mad. He said, I felt an in absolutely incredible sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there in the presence of these entities. And yet I couldn't move, I couldn't cry out, I couldn't get away. Whatever was there seemed to monstrously ugly, so filthy and dark and sinister. Of course they were demons, and I couldn't get away. In fact, one of Whitley's uh, guests uh, at a LA meeting, Elaine Morganelli, she came up with the simple yet chilling answer as to why these entities would do this to people. She said, quote, people can be duped by devils. A demonic spirit can tell you anything. They love to fool you. These people, the UFO abductees, are being taken over. The more you go along with it, the harder it is to get away from it. But to what purpose? Well, she says, I think they're being used to get an anti-Christian movement going. What got me was when he, Whitley, referred to the Lord and his angels as the Nazis of the air. And then Stuart Goldman, the newspaper writer we saw earlier, and who has also talked with Whitley Strymer on several occasions, he says this, quote, One could write Morganelli off as some sort of Christian fanatic. However, she's not the only one who's come to the conclusion that Strieber's visitors, uh, in turn, uh, the beings who are abducting countless thousands of people, are nothing more than, listen, good old-fashioned demons doing what they do best, stealing souls. Hey folks, come on, is this stuff starting to add up or what? But that's still not all. Another characteristic of demonic appearances is that when people do have encounter with UFOs, oftentimes they end up doing one of three things. Okay, one, it just so happens after encountering a UFO, uh, people have a tendency to go deeper into the occult uh, or new age, i.e. they are led further and further away from God and Jesus and the Bible. Two, oftentimes they just happen to go insane or literally, as we'll see here shortly, become demonically possessed exactly like what happened to this man. Let's take a look. On the evening of October 25, 1973, a young Pennsylvania farmer, Stephen Pulaski, and at least 15 other witnesses saw a bright object hovering over a field near them. Stephen grabbed his rifle and went to investigate. It was then that he noticed something walking along by the fence. They were hairy and long-armed, with greenish-yellow eyes, and a smell like burning rubber was present. Stephen sensed that these creatures were not friendly, and fired a tracer bullet over their heads. And when they kept on coming, he fired directly at one of them. The creatures then all disappeared into the woods, and the glowing object disappeared from the field instantaneously. UFO researchers, as well as a state trooper, were called in to investigate. When they arrived, the people there told them that Stephen had been growling like an animal and flailing his arms. His own dog ran toward him, and Stephen attacked the dog. Stephen then collapsed, and after a time, began to come to his senses. The entire group commented 
on the nauseating, sulfur-like odor that was present. Now, speaking of strange smells, and specifically the smell of sulfur, not only did we see that same strange odor presence earlier in the history of UFOs, if you recall, but it's quite common in both demon and alien encounters. Let's take a look. The Amityville Horror was based on a factual account of what happened to a family in Amityville, New York. An irritating and nauseating odor seemed to accompany the presence of the ghost or spirit entity that entered there from time to time. Whitley Stryver wrote of his abduction experiences in his book, Communion. He said he could smell their presence and that it smelled like sulfur. Now here's the point. Little do most people realize that sulfur, of all things, just happens to be the smell to describe the lake of fire. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 states, But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. And with these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 21 verse 8, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, and those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Not copper, not cheeseburgers, not even stale milk. But come on, for, of all things for aliens to smell like when they appear on the scene is sulfur? The very stench of hell and demons in the lake of fire? I don't think that's by chance, folks. But that's still not all. The third characteristics of demonic appearances is that when people do have an encounter with UFOs, okay, they not only uh, go deeper into the occult, or New Age, i.e., again, further away from God, they not only, two, go insane or become demonically possessed, as you just saw, but three, they also commit suicide. And remember, that's exactly what demons do. Their leader is Satan. He's a murderer, as we already saw, and he's been one from the beginning. But sometimes, and this is the tricky part, UFOs will also appear on the scene with a different kind of emotion. You see, they can also apparently appear on the scene and oftentimes do with a sense of euphoria. And this is important because people will invariably say something like this, oh, oh, come on, don't tell me these uh, aliens were demons. I mean, I experienced nothing but beauty and light. I, I felt so much love emanating from them. It was, it was totally pleasant. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. I mean, these are demons? I mean, come on, you're crazy. Not so. You see, the Bible says that aim, uh, angels, which again, demons are, just of the fallen category, uh, they can play a good cop, so-called bad cop on you and deceive you. And that's clearly what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 through 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. And believe it or not, these guys I'm about to show you found out the hard way just how deceptive these beings can be, including going to the extreme of playing good cop, bad cop on you, masquerading as a so-called angel of light. Let's take a look. Mike Mandel is a Canadian entertainer and lecturer. For many years, he was involved in various aspects of the occult, including spirit mediumship. Dozens of entities would speak through him on an ongoing basis. I became involved in what is now known as channeling in the late 1960s. It was a spontaneous experience. We had been trying astral travel and a group of other techniques to let our spirits leave our bodies, to develop clairvoyant abilities, and so on. And when I say we, I mean a small group of us that had polarized together around an occult worldview. By trying these different techniques, I inadvertently opened myself up, and various entities began speaking through me, initially speaking in my head, and then eventually taking over to such a degree they were using my vocal cords and speaking through me to our friends. Mike would literally, could literally be talking to you as I'm talking to you now, 
and instantly, um, in a moment, change and be taken over and someone else would be talking and his voice would literally stop being Mike and all of a sudden be somebody else. Initially, it seemed to take them quite a bit of effort to take control of me and it was more or less a voluntary thing. But as time passed, I realized that it was getting much, much easier for them to slip in and out. We used to call it someone popping in. We'd say, oh, so-and-so just popped in when you were gone. And they would appear sometimes for hours, sometimes for just a few minutes. And then we realized eventually that they were able to go in and out as they pleased by the end of things. In, and we asked one of the entities, someone asked on my behalf and said, why is it that you can get in and out of Mike's personality so readily? And they said something to the effect of, all human beings have a door that will keep other spirit beings out. And in most people's cases, the door is locked and barred and stapled shut and roped shut and sealed. And they said in my case, it was virtually hanging off the hinges. They claimed to be uh, distinctive entities. In other words, if, the, if they had a name, they would say their name. If they had a purpose or a, a distinctive, they would tell you that uh, in, in many cases. But the, the range would range from very what we call low level life forms that really didn't seem to have any purpose except to be pranksters, that sort of thing. Uh, on up to uh, through the through the sort of human range right on up to the what you call ascended masters the the wise benevolent powerful type uh, entities and the antithesis of that the evil um, powerful um, intelligent uh, entities as well they claim to be ascended masters um, highly advanced spirit beings even on other planets people on various astral planes who had reincarnated and then gone on to perfection, uh, Tibetan Buddhists, people from the past. I mean, there was an entire realm of things that they called themselves. However, the common thread was they were all spiritually pure and were contacting our little group specifically to help us evolve spiritually. Warder often witnessed strange occurrences. He feared the darker controlling entities, one of whom regularly threatened him with knives. Still, he was fascinated by the spirit's powers. Uh, one evening when I was over at Mike's place, we were uh, just sitting talking when all of a sudden a, one of the entities popped in and became visibly angry with, I think, primarily myself and um, began ranting and raving. I can't remember the exact words he was saying, but he, he got up and, and sort of stormed off into the kitchen my habit being that to always follow Mike into the kitchen or anywhere where there were knives present. And so I just followed, but I was very concerned with what was going on. Uh, as I got to the doorway of the kitchen, uh, Mike, quote, Mike was standing and had picked up two Coke bottles off the counter, two 26-ounce Coke bottles, and held them both out in front of him and crushed them simultaneously, one in each hand. Uh, then, unfortunately, Mike, the entity left, and Mike was not able to come back right away. And in that delay time, uh, Mike fell forward into the broken glass, uh, cutting his, I don't know if his hands were cut at that moment or when he actually crushed the bottles, but they were cut fairly badly. Um, he was obviously in shock when he came, when he came back. I got him up, moved him to the, to the couch in the living room, uh, and again he was taken over this time by another entity which seemed much gentler more benevolent and held out his hands in a very almost pathetic sort of way and said do the wounds on my hands seem familiar to you and now we had an entity who was claiming to be or imitating christ one of the things the entities used to do was they used to test us it was as though we were being brainwashed we'd be told to do something very bizarre immediately or we'd be told to go at midnight to this certain forest that was very very terrifying to us because there'd been a number of manifestations there we'd be told to go alone there at midnight and stay there for an hour and then come home and they were testing our readiness to respond immediately to their commands and we were not to test them ever because they always said proof comes to those who do not ask for it which sounds vaguely biblical but it isn't and I recall one time one of the entities was put to the test one of the particular people in the group suddenly spoke to it in German and the entity without missing a beat stops its sentence with the other person turned and addressed him in flawless German and then turned back and continued the conversation well none of us 
knew German. None of us had studied it at any time. But the entity was able to switch in and out of the other language immediately. Manuel Swedenborg spent an entire lifetime associating with the spirit world. Yet he warned, when the spirits begin to speak with a man, he ought to beware that he believes nothing whatever from them, for they say almost anything. Things are fabricated by them and they lie. They would tell so many lies and indeed with solemn affirmation that a man would be astonished. If a man listens and believes, they press on and deceive and seduce in many ways. Well, they claim to be ascended masters, but in reality they were the exact opposite end of the spiritual scale. Uh, there's no question in my mind now that they were demon spirits. If you had asked me then, I would have believed entirely that they were higher beings, a higher spiritual order of beings. I wouldn't have believed in demons. I didn't think they existed. I thought they were an invention of the Christian church. In retrospect now, I can see back with horrible clarity that they were malevolent, created, demonic spirits intent on our destruction. Some of these entities out here will say, oh yeah, they're bad spirits uh, and they're good spirits. In fact, um, uh, the old mediums uh, before the channelers came along, it was a little more complicated. And the mediums would have a control. It was called a control spirit. And the control function, the function of the control spirit was to keep the bad spirits away uh, and to kind of line things up, you know, and make it work out uh, as it should. And they would even say, oh, that was a lower entity. In my own case, I recall that some of the entities we had to deal with were overtly violent, almost psychotic. And the others were pure and altruistic, and all they wanted to do was help us, and they would warn us about things that the nasty entities were doing, and they would give us teaching and methods of developing ourselves and so on. In retrospect, I'd like to say that all the entities were equally evil. It was the clever way it was presented by showing this group as overtly evil that made us more ready to accept these guys as the good guys. In reality, they were all in it together. Whatever they say they are, Jesus Christ, Buddha, your Aunt Vera, whoever, they're not these pure, altruistic, beautiful beings that they seem to be. If you strip away the covering, you'll find a demon behind every one of these voices, behind every one of the spirits. In fact, one of their most clever ploys is to appear, as the Bible says, even Satan disguises as an angel of light. We're seeing these emissaries of evil that are dressing in the most wonderful packaging, so people are accepting them as genuine. People are seeing them as good and pure, and in reality, even the good ones are demon spirits. Sounds to me like demons are so sneaky that they can bait you into darkness by first appearing as an angel of light, then their true colors eventually come out. Um, gee, I wonder where I've heard that before. Okay, and speaking of their ability to masquerade and to morph into different shapes, here's what one researcher said about this deceptive characteristics of UFOs. Let's take a look. John Ankerberg, he speaks on their morphine abilities. He says, quote, around the globe, there are tens of thousands of reported UFO entity cases, thousands involving human abduction reports. These entities range in size from just a few inches to almost 20 feet, but usually between four and seven feet. They appear in forms that are human or humanoid, robot or animal-like, bizarre or ghostly. Sometimes these entities exhibit deliberate hostility towards humans, which has resulted in physical or psychological harm and even, listen, possession by the entity. Most of the time they feign an aloofness towards man or in contacting cases a genuine concern. Sometimes, just like UFOs, these beings appear independently in three-dimensional space and time, while at other times they exist only in the experience of the observer. The morphology or form of the UFO occupants suggests ties to the Earth, not outer space. Classification of the entities corresponds broadly to creatures of historic folklore, mythology, demonology, and occultism in a wide variety of times and cultures. The fact that the UFO entities fit historic patterns of previously existing morphological types from many occultic traditions argues for their being indigenous to this planet. Both Lawson and Valet 
have done interesting and important work in this field. It is significant that Lawson himself observes, quote, the devil is a polymorph and so can mimic any form imaginable or change his size at will. And folks, that's exactly what these UFO entities do, okay? And that's why many researchers, not just myself, but many researchers just flat out call them for what they are. They too believe that they're demonic. But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to the secular researchers and you tell me if they too agree what we're dealing with here. Let's take a look at their quotes. Secular researcher Jacques Vallée says that they're demons. Here's what he says, quote, we are dealing with a yet unrecognized level of consciousness independent of man, but closely linked to the earth. I do not believe anymore that UFOs are simply the spacecraft of some race of extraterrestrial visitors. This notion is too simplistic to explain their appearance, the frequency of their manifestations through recorded history, and the structure of the information exchanged with them during contact. Uh, an impressive parallel can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons, he says. UFOs can project images or fabricated scenes designed to change our belief systems. Human belief is being, listen, controlled and conditioned. Man's concepts are being rearranged, and we may be headed towards a massive change in human attitudes towards paranormal abilities and extraterrestrial lives. In other words, they're deceiving us. Remember, that's what Jesus said, watch out for in the last days. And he goes on to say, the medical examination to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. The symbolic display seen by the abductees is identical to the type of initiations ritual or astral voyage that is embedded in the occult traditions of every culture. Thus, he says, the structure of abduction stories is identical to that of occult initiation rituals. Cato, he says this about uh, UFOs being demonic in nature. He says this, he says, quote, a large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with the mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist or ghost manifestations and possession. He says many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomena. Garin, he states this, he's a, a doctor, eminent scientist from the French National Council for Scientific Research. He has this to say. He says UFO behavior, listen, is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it. The modern UFO knots and the demons of the past are probably identical, he says. What is quite certain is that the phenomenon is active here on our planet and active here as master, i.e. they're the ones who's really controlling things behind the scenes. And even John Keel, he says this, he's one of the most informed persons in the world on UFOs and he's the author of the now classic UFOs Operation Trojan Horse. And here's what he stated, he said, quote, the manifestations and occurrences described in this imposing literature of demonology are similar, listen, if not entirely identical to the UFO phenomenon itself. He says the UFO manifestations seem to be, by and large, merely minor variations of the age-old demonological phenomenon. And Mackey says this, he's a former chairman of the respected British UFO Research Association, he said this, if one sets the three occult groups against the three classifications of UFO entities and their characteristics, he says, it is rather surprising how complementary to each other they appear to be, not only through their appearance, activities, and level of behavior, but also in the quality of mental and especially emotional reaction and response that has been noted to have occurred on contact. In fact, uh, Trevor Jaynes, he's a veteran re researcher on UFOs, he says this quote, a, listen, this is amazing, a working knowledge of the occult science is indispensable to UFO investigation. In fact, a couple of different sociologists, Stuppel and McNeese, they said, quote, studies of flying saucer cults repeatedly show that they are part of a larger occult social world. And again, Keelan Ballet, uh, uh, Operation Trojan Horse, 
and uh, Valet in the book Messengers of Deception both believe that the UFO entities are, and these are some of the best secular researchers on the topic, but they believe that the UFO entities are, quote, deliberately programming their human observers with false information in order to hide their true nature and purpose. Dr. Valet, by the way, uh, has actually addressed the UN, the United Nations, on UFOs, and he was the model for Lacombe in Steven Spielberg's film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It was based on him. And he has spent uh, decades in serious UFO research, and like veteran UFO researcher John Keel, he has put his intellectual finger on the lowest common denominator of UFO contacts. And here it is, the word, listen, deception. Remember what Jesus said in the beginning, deception. Don't let anybody deceive you. And he also says the most common parallel to UFO phenomena is paganism and, quote, demonology. Valet also reveals that, quote, the UFO beings of today belong to the same class of manifestation as the occult entities that were described in the centuries past. In other words, they're demons, okay? And that's why John Akerberg, he states this. He says, no one can deny uh, that even non-Christian researchers have concluded that the UFO phenomenon is an occult one. If it can be established that the world of the occult is the masterpiece of the biblical Satan and, and his demons, then it is logical to conclude that UFOs constitute a demonic phenomenon with a hidden agenda. After 20 years, he says, uh, the extent and depth of our research now constitutes for us a conclusion that has become a virtual certainty that UFOs constitute a spiritistic, i.e. demonic, phenomenon. We believe that such a conclusion may affect us all. You better believe it will. And folks, can I tell you, the agenda is to deceive us just like Jesus said would happen in the last days, to go along with the Antichrist kingdom. We are clearly dealing with demons here. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But before you go, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today, that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple things with you. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the Bible also says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness is death. In other words, when we die, and it's coming for each one of us, we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, but it's going to happen. The Bible says, therefore, since the wages of our sin is death, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and not to heaven. And that's bad enough, but to make matters worse, we don't want to admit this. God already knows. He knows uh, all of our behavior, everything, our thoughts, what we've done, what even we're going to do. He knows it all. He's gone. Even though he already knows this, we don't want to admit this. And so, out of love and mercy, God gave us something called his law, or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like his x-ray into our heart to show us what he already knows, that he is holy and that we are not. And it's this unholiness or sin that separates us from him. Let's take a look at God's x-ray, if you will, his divine law, to show us what he already knows. The Ten Commandments, uh, the ninth one, says this, you shall not bear false witness. Okay, that's called lying. Okay, and if you've ever told a lie once, which we all have, myself included, the Bible says that makes you a liar. Okay, the, the, another commandment says you shall not steal. Okay, uh, and you might think, well, that's something that everybody does. Well, it doesn't make it right, and it demonstrates what God is trying to show us, that uh, we all have sin, and it's separating us from him. Even if you took a pencil in the third grade from somebody, if you did it without permission, that's stealing. And so now you've become a thief. The Bible says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And how interesting it is and unfortunate that the only name under heaven by which men might be saved, the name Jesus Christ, has now become a common cuss word. The Bible says that God is so holy that even his name is holy. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain and used it as a cuss word or even flippantly. The Bible calls that the sin of blasphemy. And so now you become a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says if you even look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. 
And finally, the Bible says, uh, you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? Well, again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred is the same as the sin of murder. The only difference is you pulled the trigger, if you will, in your heart. You wish they were dead. And in God's eyes, it's the same thing in principle. Folks, that's only just a couple of the Ten Commandments. We didn't even go through all of them. But I think you're starting to get the picture. The Bible is correct. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, myself included. And that we are separated from God as a result. And so when our time comes, we're not automatically going to heaven. We are headed for judgment. We are headed for hell. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was the death penalty of its day. He paid in full uh, the price for our sins to be forgiven. Let me give you an analogy. For instance, even today, we could see that a person could commit a crime. Uh, they, they cannot reverse it. The, the sentence has been passed. The judge has uh, slammed his gavel, and they are ushered off into their jail cell. And in this particular crime, they are going to receive the death penalty. And so they're behind bars just waiting for the time, waiting for the call for them to go and uh, receive the death penalty. But believe it or not, as we know, there is a way that a person can get off a death row. And that is if the one in authority, the governor, would grant them a pardon. Now, they didn't earn it. Uh, they certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing they could do uh, to earn it because nothing can reverse their crime. Okay? Yet the one in authority has that ability to grant them a pardon. Well, can I tell you something? That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The cross was the death penalty of the day. God sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take the death penalty in our place, and that if we would just receive his pardon for all of our sins, God is willing to allow us to get off a death row. He's willing to forgive us completely of all of our sins. That's the good news that I want to share with you. God loves you. The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Won't you, if that's you, call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now? Won't you ask him to forgive you of your sins? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Won't you do that now, wherever you are? Please, take God up on his amazing, loving offer. I'll let you down. Man will let you down. People will let you down. But God never will. He wants to adopt you into his forever family. He loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done, past, present, and future. It's amazing. Please, call upon Jesus now. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Our number and information will come up here on the screen here shortly. And remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.